Brian Newbert here again from goldenblack.com. It is Thursday, May 14th. Uh, this is your goldenblack.com daily quarantine uh, simulcast for today, second to last of the week. Uh, it is brought to you by Fox Purdue Bookstores, Purdue Federal Credit Union, the Sixth Street Dive Restaurant, First Source Bank, East End Grill, and the Chargers Team Remax Ability Plus. I want to remind you once again, if you're looking for a hell of a dinner, or to support our local businesses through quarantine here, please keep in mind the East End Grill in downtown Lafayette, the 6th Street Dive around downtown Lafayette, Arnie's all over the state, Bruno's in West Lafayette, and the Whitaker Inn out in West Lafayette. All of them would love to hear from you. Um, also want to remind you, if you're accessing this via YouTube or whatever platform, our podcast platform at Golden Black Radio, please subscribe. When the world starts to spin again, we will have a... Um, Steady flow, once again, of content. The word I hate, but I keep using because there's no good synonym um, on those platforms. So please subscribe uh, if you could. There's lots to talk about right now. Um, yesterday, Purdue got a football commitment in uh, wide receiver Deion Burks. Last night, the recruiting dead period was extended through June, a very significant occurrence on the recruiting front. Um, but I did want to take one more video to talk about basketball a little bit um, in the wake of this week's news and obviously the much publicized interview Matt Painter did on the Dan Dockett show in Indianapolis yesterday. If you haven't listened to it, I would recommend uh, you listen to it. It's very interesting. It's very, very honest. Um, people, when people hear Painter talk on the radio, it tends to stand out to them a little bit more than it does to me because I've been around the man for 15 years. I kind of know what to expect from him when he opens his mouth in public. Uh, this was the sort of thing that was just that. Uh, it kind of got a little bit of national traction because of the forthrightness with which he talked about Nojel Eastern's transfer from the program, Matt Harms' transfer from the program, and just kind of the state of things right now. Um, but it was a very interesting listen. Uh, it was very consistent with Matt Painter's typical approach to such things, kind of what you get from him. He is very much uh, into honesty, very much into substance, very much into what I might call old school sensibilities. Uh, so to speak, the sort of guy who stands for things that the game is quickly passing by, yet he's been able to continue to exist in that way as the game has, again, sort of passed by a lot of the things uh, he stands for, but he is going to continue standing for them nonetheless. Uh, so once again, I would I would uh, recommend you give that a listen. Um, some of the things he said were pretty were pretty eye-opening. I think some things, too, Twitter has kind of uh, taken out of context a little bit. It's very difficult. You know, part of the challenge from a reporting perspective when you're tweeting is to make sure you get context, too, in terms of some things uh, that are said. It's very easy to take bits and pieces and warp them into something that sounds like the opposite of what the person speaking uh, intended um, to say. But obviously, the Nogel Eastern and Matt Harms uh, transfers are a little bit of a, of a uh, I don't want to call a raw um, situation for Purdue right now. Uh, obviously, when both of your uh, two seniors depart in the manner with which they departed, both of them not immediately right after the season either, both of them after taking a period of time um, before actually uh, making their intentions known, um, the story of this past season was, I didn't finish that sentence, did I? Uh, that's because I'm, I'm kind of out of control on this. Uh, I thought I had my thoughts gathered. I do not. The story of this season was this. Purdue had a bunch of really nice kids on its team. Competitiveness was seriously lacking. I think that was painfully evident. Leadership was sorely lacking. I think that was painfully evident. And I think this was the chance for No Gel Eastern and Matt Harms as the team's two most experienced guys, its two captains, its two most proven players, to really grab this thing um, by the neck, so to speak, and make something of this season. Purdue needed a lot from them, and they did not have the sorts of seasons they wanted to have. Purdue lacked leadership. Purdue lacked an edge. And I think that reflects on those two players probably more than it did anyone else. I said all season long, Purdue had a lot of nice kids, not a lot of killers. And I think that needed to start with the most experienced guys on the team. And for them to both go experience that sort of 
situation in their most important seasons of their Purdue careers and then leave uh, afterwards. Obviously, the optics of that are not are not ideal. Obviously, both left for their own reasons, uh, but they left nonetheless. And, uh, yeah, I think that kind of got to, to Painter's point about how when when adversity, you know, hits, you stay and you deal with it. And, uh, you know, I think the, the – uh, difference between one season to the next for Purdue was pretty was pretty marked because for as much as you know people are talking right now about No Joe Eastern Matt Harms leaving after a difficult season I think you should use that to frame what happened before this and give Carson Edwards and Ryan Klein a hell of a lot of credit for the season before because they were in that same position they were those two most experienced guys that really needed to grab that season by the neck. And that's exactly what they did. And to go through both of those guys to give them credit for this, they both deserve tremendous credit for this. Carson Edwards was the only freshman okay, on Purdue, in Purdue's recruiting class. That means he spent his first couple weeks being the only guy getting yelled at in practice. He was on a team surrounded by juniors and seniors who knew what they were doing. So every time he didn't know what he was doing in practice, he got yelled at. That was extremely difficult for him. I know that. He was... You can't tell me there weren't days where he was homesick. That kid loves his family more than I think any kid I've ever covered. And he's from Houston. He's, you know, the proverbial fish out of water story in West Lafayette, Indiana. Um, I can guarantee you there were significant moments of homesickness for him. When Purdue was overseas playing in the World University Games, his home city of Houston was underwater. I mean, there was all sorts of things that kid fought through stayed at Purdue, worked his ass off the entire time, made himself an All-American, made himself an unbelievable player. Um, he stayed. He fought through it. He could have gone – he could have transferred easily. You can't tell me after his freshman year, the University of Texas wouldn't have taken him. You can't tell me Houston wouldn't have taken him in a, heart, in a heartbeat where he could be closer to home. He could, he could star in his home state. He could have done that. He could have done that easily, and he didn't. He stayed, and he worked like no player – at Purdue, Caleb Swanigan, perhaps aside, has worked, and he deserves tremendous credit for that. Ryan Klein was stuck, literally stuck, behind Dakota Mathias for three years. Dakota Mathias was a great college player. I mean, a really, really good college player, a great player at Purdue, a guy who was just really good. And the timing uh, of Ryan Klein coming in right behind him, you know, was not ideal for Ryan Klein maximizing his opportunities at Purdue. He did not redshirt as a freshman. He played three years essentially behind Dakota Mathias. The first year, he he split his minutes between Dakota Mathias and Kendall Stevens, too. And obviously, his sophomore year had a uh, uh, obviously an off the court issue. His own personal his own personal problems. He could have bolted. He could have run. He could have just gotten the hell out of Dodge and uh, f- found a place where he would have played more. Found a place where he could have run from the optics of his issue. And he didn't do that. He stayed. He got one full season as a frontline player for Purdue. And damned if he didn't make the absolute most of it. Had a hell of a season. Won a Big Ten championship. Damn near went to the Final Four. That is the sort of thing that Purdue would love to have gotten from Nogel Eastern and Matt Harms last season. That is a thing Purdue would have loved to have gotten from Nogel Eastern and Matt Harms next season. uh, Should they have returned. Obviously they are not. But I did want to take this opportunity to give Ryan Klein and Carson Edwards a hell of a lot of credit for doing exactly what Purdue did not get uh, this past season. Um, Again, Purdue needed leadership. Purdue needed its veteran players to play like veteran players. Purdue needed its most established and best players. Uh, I think Nogel Eastern and Matt Harms came into the last season. It was a reasonable presumption that those two guys, plus probably Travion Williams, you know, were Purdue's three highest end players. Um, Purdue needed those guys to have their best seasons. Purdue needed those guys to be leaders. And obviously the season went how the season went. And that reflects, I think, on the older guys more than it reflected on anybody else. Now, all of this being said, I sound like a, a recruit making an announcement of some kind there by saying, with that being said, because I think the recruit announcement, the notes app announcement by by high school kids these days has been a renaissance of sorts for the phrase with that being said, because they all say that the the last sentence or two of those announcements all are prefaced with, with that being said. Um, Anyway, with that being said, I think 
with Purdue now. They face another, what I would call, cultural turning point. And they've had a couple of these over the years. Rafael Davis loomed really, really large um, as part of one of them. The 2014 class was part of that as well. Those guys brought Purdue tremendous substance when Purdue needed substance desperately. Rafael Davis, people I don't think understand his legacy necessarily uh, in terms of the leadership he provided when Purdue needed leadership that does not show up in statistics, uh, but it was one of the most impactful elements of Purdue's turnaround here, making, I think, what, six NCAA tournaments in a row, something like that. Um, now Purdue stands in this position again, where I think the guys you needed to be your cultural stalwarts, um, A, failed, and then B, left. Uh, and now Purdue's in a bit of a a bit of a different situation here where now you're sitting here and you've got four juniors who need to be your seniors. Now, two of those guys are fourth year juniors, so they're not necessarily traditional juniors, but you have a team that needed to be led last season. And now the guys who needed to be led last season need to be the leaders themselves. Leaders don't have to be seniors. You know, that that's just not the reality of it. Uh, but Purdue needs its older guys now uh, to really to play like older guys, Purdue needs some uh, some guys to step up and be and be something much different than they were last season. They need leadership. They need competitiveness. They need an edge. They need a work ethic. Uh, I, I think you know, looking back on it now, hindsight when covering a program, when watching a program, whatever it might be, always is clearer than foresight. Is that the word? Uh, and when Matt Painter, before the season, said to his team that he gathered everybody, he looked them over, and he said, who here has worked as hard as Carson Edwards? And who here has worked it as, as hard as Caleb Swanigan? And to hear him tell it, no one replied in the affirmative. There was your first red flag, guys. Uh, there was your first red flag on this uh, season that did not go as Purdue wanted it to go. Um these guys now have to change it. The Eric Hunters, the Sasha Stefanovic's, the Travion Williams, the Aaron Wheelers, the uh, Isaiah Thompsons, the guys coming back to this year's team have to lead this now. And, um, you know, it doesn't just have to be them. I think, you know, every team has cultural tone setters. Uh, and, you know, I think if anybody profiles for – that sort of thing kind of moving forward. Every, look, everything I have heard, it's hard for me to say this because I haven't necessarily always seen it with my own eyes. I prefer to see things with my own eyes before I say them publicly. But everything I've been told, everything I've heard anecdotally, everything to a lesser extent I have witnessed, Mason Gillis and Brandon Newman are two extremely hardworking players. I know this to a certain extent, because when a Purdue basketball home game ends, I work several hours in the arena. And when I leave, I go past the floor and I go past the practice gym. And I know a number of times there was a basketball bouncing. This is well after midnight. There was a basketball bouncing in the practice facility. And it was one of the two redshirting freshmen, if not both of them. Uh, They're late, late, late at night working out hours after a game that they couldn't even play in. Uh, those guys, their work ethic, they can take that upon themselves. That is how they can impact this program in the short term. I think Ethan Morton's substance, I think Jaden Ivey's intensity and energy, uh, manic work ethic from everything it's been described to me as, I think the young guys can also be very much a part of the solution here. And Purdue certainly needs it to be. Uh, because once again, Purdue had a bunch of really, really nice really, really laid back kids on its roster this year and went 500. They need competitors, they need killers, and they need a foundation of substance, of competitiveness, of drive, of work ethic, whatever it may be. I know that sounds like a lot of cliches and stuff, but that stuff is real. You know, uh, I'm not part of a college basketball program, but I see it up close enough to know what's important and what's not. Um, and that stuff is really important. And Purdue just needs to find it right now uh, on paper, it doesn't look like it's obviously there, 
but Purdue needs to find it one way or another when all these guys are at home and they're doing whatever they're doing on their own uh, because it's such a non-traditional offseason. That's where it has to start. Uh, this team has to has to find the sort of intangibles that the team before it had, the, the, the work ethic of Carson Edwards, the substance of Ryan Klein and, and Grady Eifert, but also whatever it was that compelled Carson Edwards and Ryan Klein to stick at Purdue through really, really difficult times. Those guys deserve tremendous credit for that uh, because that was the opposite of what Purdue had this season. And um, I think the contrast between one season and the next is really, really stark. Uh, so that's what I wanted to talk about. Look, I, I, I don't I don't mean to do 25 content items. I keep using the word content even though I hate it. I, I don't mean to do 25 content items every time I can transfers, but um, I did – come up with this today, this, a, a lot of these thoughts this morning, and um, it always happens right after I write my column. You know, I write my column on Wednesday, and then I think about a bunch of things that I think are interesting and compelling, and my next column's not till Wednesday. So you're my outlet for my uh, surplus overflow thoughts. So thanks, everybody, for lending your ear to my surplus uh, thoughts for the week, and uh, I hope you have a good rest of your Thursday. This has been your goldenblack.com nose is itching. This has been your goldenblack.com daily quarantine simulcast brought to you once again by Fox Purdue Bookstores, Purdue Federal Credit Union, the Sixth Street Dive Restaurant, First Source Bank, East End Grill, and the Charters Team Remaxability Plus. Want to remind you once again, and as always, and until the day this is all over with, East End Grill, Sixth Street Dive, Bruno's, Arnie's, Whitaker Inn, all remain open for care orders. All would love to hear from you. All will provide you with what I like to call damn good food. Thanks, everybody.